This is NCC Unplugged. Hello and welcome again to NCC Unplugged. We are so glad that you're joining us. My name is Joshua Persall. I'm the executive minister here at NCC, and I'm joined uh, with our normal host, Jeff Terstra, our preaching minister. Hello, hello. So we are, we're looking forward to a great podcast today. I'll let Jeff take it from here. Thank you, Joshua, for that wonderful introduction. So we want to cover a good bit of ground today. Uh, we know we're not going to be able to cover all of it, but maybe you've seen, uh, based on the title of this episode, what we're going to be talking about. But essentially, we want to answer the question, do Christians have to follow the Old Testament? Another way it's... You know, another question is, uh, are we under the Ten Commandments? Do we have to follow the Ten Commandments? Yeah, the Ten Commandments are, when you think about things in the Bible that like general culture is aware of, you think about things like Christmas, you think about things like John 3.16, but the Ten Commandments is very high. People who may not have studied the Bible may not follow Jesus, but they have some, just some identification about what the Ten Commandments are. It might not be Mm -hmm. totally biblical, but Mm -hmm. like they've heard of it. Right, right, right. So I have a funny story about the Ten Commandments going all the way back to Bible college. Uh, I had a great Old Testament professor called Doc Smith. He taught all the Old Testament classes, Hebrew, and uh, he loved projects. So there was always group projects or individual projects in his class, and that was kind of the keystone type things in his classes. They led up to these big projects. And so one of them was this project on the, uh, the Ten Commandments. And so... When you're in college, you know, you get a lot of your work the first day in your syllabus and you go over the syllabus, talk about these big projects that are coming up. And then like any good college student, you forget about it until the due date. (laughs) And so this project we knew was coming up and was essentially the project was make something physical with the Ten Commandments. Uh, But at the beginning of class, that first day when he's going over the syllabus, he says, I don't want any of the same old stuff. I don't want... Uh, I don't want you to like out of Plato make two tablets. Like it's got to be accurate and that's just not accurate. It's got to be like, you could do a PowerPoint presentation. You could do um, like, you could make a toy that represented one of like, I don't, I don't even remember all the options, but it was pretty much, you know, endless creativity. So the weekend before the project is due, uh, I get to thinking about what I'm going to do for the project. And I, I guess I forgot some of the qualifications for the Ten Commandment project. And I said, I, I asked my friends, and I was dating my wife at the time, Allison. And I said, I remember specifically asking them, I said, now, did he say we couldn't do these clay tablets or we could? And they're like, mm, I'm not quite sure. And I, it was like early days of PowerPoint. And I was like, I don't think I can do a PowerPoint presentation. I don't, I don't understand that. So I'm going to do clay tablets, like whether we can or not. So I got this like clay you can bake in the oven. It becomes hard and it was going to be like this Old Testament style, you know, clay tablets that you see on the movies and just kind of like scribbling in the clay. And then on the back, this was the really creative idea. I thought on the back, uh, I, I glued them down to a chalkboard thing that I cut out. And this was to test yourself. So on the front, you read the Ten Commandments on the back, you were supposed to test yourself, like which commandment was which, right? Um, So you put your project in the classroom for the day and then left, and he would walk through the classroom and interact with the the project and and grade you. (sighs) I got a D on that project, Joshua. Ouch, ouch. I think that was the only thing in college I ever got that low of a grade on. Now, you're you're saying clay. We're... The, the original Ten Commandments, were they on stone? Yeah, so I thought this would be a great idea, but it was just because, like, everybody had done it for the previous okay. 25 years of his teaching. Yeah. Um, and so he felt too bad to fail me, <laughs> but he gave me the lowest passing grade I could get. Did he say why? Like, why, why no, it was, was it okay? it was because at the beginning of the class, he told me I couldn't do that. Oh, yeah, because it was against the rules. It was against the rules, okay, but yeah. partly I blamed my friends because I was like, I asked you, and they're like, yeah, but ultimately it was your idea. And I was like, yeah, no, you're right. Um, so that's a memory that sticks out in my mind about the Ten Commandments. So college days, did were you the, were you a person who would pull all-nighters? Like you would procrastinate some and pull all-nighters? <sighs> mm. Sometimes. 
okay. sometimes. Yeah. I wasn't, yeah. there was other kids that were like, that's what they did all the time. Uh-huh. I wasn't that. Uh-huh. Um, but there's definitely times that, yeah. And, <laughs> in fact, and, uh, this may be even worse. So getting my master's degree through seminary is all online. Okay. Uh, and it was through a school in Illinois, which is a two hour time difference. Oh, wow. So I had to turn, like the papers were due 11.59 p.m., but really, for me, they were due one fifty nine a.m. because with the time change, right? Yes, they would receive it at eleven fifty nine. So that was, you know, I wasn't very good at math, but I was good enough to realize the time change was in my favor, and I could even procrastinate two more hours to get that paper turned in online. And how did how did your next day go when you turned in a paper at one fifty nine a.m.? Um, I was a youth minister at that time, uh-huh. so you'd have to ask the other staff members that I was working with. But is that is that when you had your office down in the basement, kind of away from everybody else? Hey, it was cool. It was a Did good you environment have a couch to sleep in. There? in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, anyway. enough about me. Okay, so okay. back to our question: Do Christians need to follow the Ten Commandments or the Old Testament? I think probably the most popular verse that would be brought up with this topic is Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. And so the context of this is at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus talks about blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful. And I'm going over those like it's not important. It's definitely important. But right after that, Um, It talks about us being the salt of the earth, light of the world. Verse 17, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen by any means, disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So, what I get from these verses... Jesus is not coming, and what he's about to teach in the Sermon on the Mount is not different than the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It's not that he's above the Old Testament and he's throwing everything away. He's disregarding what God said. He's taking the Ten Commandments, crumpling them up, and throwing in the trash. trash Rather, he's fulfilling them, uh, being the final period at the end of the Old Testament to say it is finished, right? Which is some of his words on the cross. Um, And so he came to fulfill them. He came to accomplish the Old Testament. And so we can still talk about, okay, what does that exactly mean? Um, And as we see the the biggest difference between the Old Testament and New Testament would say Jesus would be the biggest difference that we see Um, But it's not that Jesus isn't in the Old Testament, and it's not that the Old Testament isn't in the New Testament. Um, The reason they're called Old Testament and New Testament, really they're based on these covenants that God has with his people. Mm -hmm. And there's actually more than two covenants in the Bible. Uh, Depending on how you count a covenant, there's between five and seven covenants. Um, One is a a covenant with Moses— uh, with, with Moses, yeah. I meant to say with, with Noah, though, too. There's a, a covenant with Noah where um, the rainbow, the rainbow's yeah, covenant. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, that God says, I'll never do this to my people again mm-hmm. or do this to people again to uh, kill them with, with a flood. Um, there's, a mo- there's a covenant that God makes with Abraham mm-hmm. that he's going to have a child, and that's fulfilled. So some covenants we see coming fulfilled in their shorter covenants. Others right. are longer. Mm-hmm. That's kind of summed up in the Old Testament with the covenant of Moses and the law that he gives through the Ten Commandments that mm-hmm. I will be your your God, you will be my people, here's how you be my people by following this, and if you follow this, I will protect you, I will guide you, I'll bring you into a land flo- overflowing with milk and honey. Um, New Testament, we see a covenant, God with his people through Christ, a, a covenant of Christ, um, that we see God's love through Christ and what Christ accomplished on the cross and the story um, of Jesus on the cross and living his life. But we can see glimpses of both of those things outside of those covenants. And so some of it is called progressive revelation. And we can see how the New Testament is seen in the Old Testament, um, that 
actually the Old Testament was, um, it, it depends on who you read. There's a lot of books about this, a lot of articles to read. Um, but the Old Testament was the start of God's plan, mm -hmm. and God's plan progressed and found fulfillment, like Jesus said in those verses of Matthew, found fulfillment in Jesus. And so again, it's not that the New Testament disqualifies the Old Testament or the Old Testament was wrong in any regard. Um, it's actually that the New Testament um, brings greater understanding to the Old Testament. And that this goes back to one of the great things that that uh, Bible professor, professor Doc Smith said to me, because he, like I said, he taught Hebrew at the school and uh, just really great knowledge in Hebrew. He was asked to be on several uh, Bible translation committees throughout the years because of his understanding of Hebrew. And he studied at a, a Jewish Hebrew school. And I remember him talking about how he originally went to a Jewish school to, to, to learn Hebrew in the Old Testament, thinking, okay, if, if anybody's going to understand the Old Testament, it's the Jewish people today. Mm -hmm. um, but part of his understanding changed because he knew actually to, f to understand the Old Testament as God wants us to understand the Old Testament is to know Jesus and to actually see Jesus in the Old Testament. And so their understanding of the Hebrew, of the Old Testament is actually limited mm -hmm. because they don't see what God originally meant for us to see in the Old Testament, and that's to be mm -hmm. seen through Christ. Now, that's really interesting insight. I think um, from my perspective, it's, it's easy to see or easier to see how the, the Old Testament is preparatory and how it led it led us to Christ, mm -hmm. but I really appreciate the insight you're bringing to see that we can, there's, there are very clear ways to see Christ in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I think that's very insightful. Yeah. It's very helpful. So here's one verse uh, that gets at that. There, there's several others. Uh, Jesus says in John 5, 39, you study the scriptures diligently. So he's talking to Pharisees, teachers of the law. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So Jesus is saying, you're studying all these things, and, and they were. I mean, they were zealous for reading the scripture and interpreting it the way that they understood it. And he's saying, these are the very scriptures that testify about me. He's, he's talking about the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a New Testament in Jesus' day yet, and so he's talking about the Old Testament being scriptures that talk to him or talk about him. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's hard for us in, in our who we are ethnically, not being Jews, and also in our culture today, two thousand years to remove, to hardly appreciate how passionately they were anticipating the Messiah. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, and we yeah. know a lot of them just missed the fact that Jesus was that Messiah. They were looking for a different personality, a different uh, you know, a different platform, if you will, than Jesus brought. But you're right. I mean, they were passionate and zealous, and they were looking for the Messiah for a lot of a variety of reasons. Yeah. Big deal. Yeah, here's another Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he pointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to set this understanding that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. Um, in my mind, we are not held by Old Testament law and standards anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I don't think we can throw it away. I don't think that's what Scripture did. Um, and th this is the best way to understand how to use the Old Testament is by looking at the New Testament. How did the New Testament mm -hmm. writers understand the Old Testament? Um, they quoted it a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. They... Um, often affirmed what it said mm -hmm. or brought a greater interpretation, understanding to it. And so Jesus didn't throw away the laws of the Old Testament. He didn't throw away the, old, the Ten Commandments. But it, but also through the New Covenant and what we read in, in the New Testament, um, we're not held to that anymore. In fact, one of the longest quotes of the Old Testament in the New Testament, so does that make sense? It, the biggest quote in the New Testament that is referring directly to an Old Testament passage is a bit about this, this covenantal mm. theology stuff. And 
Um, when I say covenantal theology in this context, I just mean Old Testament, New Testament. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's found in Hebrews 8. And Hebrews is a book written to the Jews, the Hebrews, um, about Jesus. And we'll talk more about this a little bit later in this podcast, but um, explaining a lot about Jesus being better than the angels, Jesus being better than what they saw in the Old Testament, Jesus replacing what they held on to for their salvations, salvation, we don't find it in Jesus. And so Hebrews 8 is getting at this. And um, I'll start in verse 7 there. It says, for if they had, if they had been, if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, which is the Old Testament, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people. So it wasn't with the covenant because the covenant was perfect. God made the covenant. It's with the people. So God says, um, and this is a quote from Jeremiah, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. And it will not be like a covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by their hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they didn't remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will sta- establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor Say one another, know the Lord, because they all know me. For the least of them to the greatest, for I'll forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So a covenant and a um, contract are a little bit different, Mm -hmm. but for for our purposes right now, we'll just use them interchangeably. Joshua, if you had a contract written for uh, a contractor to come in and do some repairs on your house, new roof, you need a new roof, you agree to terms, you're going to pay them, they're going to replace all this, do it to these standards, Mm -hmm. you sign on the line, Mm -hmm. uh, you maybe pay them 50% up front, 10% during the job, Mm -hmm. 40% at the end. Mm -hmm. You pay your last bit of money, the job is done. They swept all around the house. All the nails are gone. Yeah. You shake hands. Mm-hmm. What are you obligated to anymore under that contract? Should be done. Should, should be done. There should be, it shouldn't be any further obligations yeah. at that point. And for them, they did what they said under the contract. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there might be something further in the contract that says, hey, w- we're going to warranty this work, you know, right. for a certain amount of time or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's part of the contract. So there might be some remaining relationship there depending mm-hmm. on things. You might call them up for another job, whatever, whatever, whatever. But the terms of that contract are over. Mm-hmm. And so here in Hebrews and other places, we get this understanding that because of Jesus's fulfillment, what this said in verse 13 because there is new, the first one, uh, because we call this one new, the New Testament, the New Covenant, the first one is obsolete. Um, again, we don't throw it away. We don't dismiss it. That's not what we see the, the writers in the New Testament doing. Um, but we understand that standard is no longer there. Right. Yeah, And, you know, when we read things in the New Testament and God has... God has given us instructions on the best way we can live as we follow Jesus. And there's a lot of similarities and a lot of alignment between how we live as New Testament Christians Mm -hmm. and how people lived under the old law. But there are some things that are, are, are different. And there's some Mm -hmm. things that are, that God has not asked us to do that he did ask, ask them to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jesus, when asked, uh, by a rich young ruler, what he could do to have eternal life. Um, Jesus replied, uh, you know the commandments. You should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. You should not, you know, yeah. paragraphing the Ten Commandments. So here's this man asking Jesus what to do, and Jesus quotes the Ten Commandments. So we know they're important. Otherwise, Jesus would have said, well, there's a new way to that. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, he didn't uh, quote, do not covet, which is exactly what he knew the man needed in his life, mm-hmm. uh, because then he tells the man to give everything to the poor, and the man walks away because he knew that was too hard for him. So Jesus knew his heart, and that's what he was getting at. He's like, uh, God actually wants all of you. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's there's other cases like that where where Paul and others will just say, um, well, you know, 
you know the commandments, you mm-hmm. know what's to be done. And the Jews had this understanding um, of this package deal, which was not just the Ten Commandments, but other things that went with it. So I guess the follow-up question, Joshua, that I know you're dying to ask, so what do we do with the New Old Testament? Right. You right. know, if yeah. we're not to throw it away, if it's important, mm-hmm. do like what what do we do with that? Um I want to offer one suggestion that I don't think is right, but I see it a lot of places, okay. um, is to try to break down the Old Testament in, in things that still remain for us, mm-hmm. uh, maybe things that Jesus quoted, maybe things that other New Testament writers talked about. Um, I mean, after all, nine out of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um so, should we just let the listeners guess which one is not? Maybe that's like if you like commenting on things, maybe comment what okay. you which which commandment okay. of the Ten Commandments is not repeated in the New Testament. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna leave them hanging. Yeah, we'll leave, leave them, them hanging. hanging okay, and see, okay. see if some people in the comments can get that right. Yeah, ten percent. Ten percent is unknown. It is. It is. Uh, so, where was I going with that? Oh yeah, yeah. So. Um, where was I going with that? Were we talking about what's our responsibility yeah, as far yeah, as keeping our, the old so, law? Okay. Um, people will break it down into three different sections, the Old Testament. And okay. they'll say, okay, there's some laws uh, in the Old Testament that are moral laws, mm-hmm. which would be the Ten Commandments, things mm-hmm. that like our hearts know are right. Do not kill. Do mm-hmm. not murder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a moral law. Don't steal from your neighbor. Those are things that, that come from our heart. Uh, moral law. There's a lot of them in the Old Testament even beyond um, the Ten Commandments. And then they'll come up with the second category of ceremonial laws. Right. Uh, these would be the laws of the sacrificial system, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sacrificing after a sin, a, a goat, a sheep, a bird, depending on, you know, what you can afford, and God lays out all these laws. And these are the laws that when you open the Old Testament just don't seem to make sense. Not to us. Not to us. Not, not, right. not, not in our us. context. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Go to the priest for this, you know, yep. illness, all different things. If, if you're bleeding, yep. all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's civil law, mm-hmm. which is this is how you interact with others. This is how the government should be. This is, um, you know, the priestly system. These are all ceremonial uh, civil laws. And so uh, people, Christians would say, well, it's clear that the civil and the ceremonial laws aren't necessarily for us. Mm-hmm. We don't have t- temple or tabernacles anymore. We don't have a priestly system that's laid out in the New Testament. So that is what is regula- re- regulated to the Old Testament and can stay there. But the moral laws are what yes. we often see repeated in the New Testament. Yep. Joshua, here's my problem with that, and I mm-hmm. think others' problems with that. That's not laid out like that in the New Testament at all. There, mm-hmm. There's no guide for that. Mm-hmm. So as as helpful as that might be for us to understand, okay, what do we take from the New Testament or Old Testament and what don't we take? Um, it's just, it's not guided like that in the New Testament. Um, it's not laid out. There's others as, as, as clear as some of the laws are. You're like, oh, this is a moral law. Others aren't. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, there's laws like, uh, don't boil the mother's. What, what do you remember that one? Oh, I don't. Oh, okay, the, is this like um, the mother's milk? The mother's milk one. What, okay. what is that one? I don't remember the details. Ah! <laughs> uh, something about boiling the calf in a mother's milk or something. Yeah, Matt's yeah. looking up for us <laughs> off screen. Um, there's others about you know what to do if you accidentally hurt somebody, and those include moral laws and ceremonial laws, and yep. so it's just. Mm-hmm. It's not as clear cut as some people would like to believe in the Old Testament laws. Um, And again, we just don't get a system of of that in the New Testament. Um, Did you find it, Matt? Don't boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Don't boil a young goat in its mother's milk. That's close. Mm -hmm. Um, So that, yeah, so I don't know. uh, That's, yeah. Would you follow that, Matt? I don't know. Matt, Matt likes eating baby goats, so I don't know uh, whether he follows that or not. But, um, you know, there's there's dress code things, and the dress codes, uh, 
aren't just ceremonial. They get at moral things. They're, they're like, you know, God's people are supposed to dress differently back then to distinguish themselves from the nations around them. So do we do that as Christians? Um, I don't wear tassels on my shirt. Right. I don't let my sideburns grow out. Um, and so I don't see it mm-hmm. that way. You know, I don't see as uh, the Old Testament being broken down in that way. So I guess the question remains, how do we see the New Te- the Old Testament? How, how are we supposed to view the Old Testament? And I want to break it down in three different ways, as, as ways that the Old Testament can benefit us as mm-hmm. Christians, um, how we see God in the Old Testament, revealing himself, and how we can continue to see it. So one of those things that um, we can see in the Old Testament is the promises and the fulfillments. Definitely. So we can see the promises that God made that span the covenants. Um, God's promises tell us about his character. God's promises tell us about um, God's faithfulness to his people. And so we can benefit as that from Christians who still serve the same God and see he is a good God. He was a good God to the people in the Old Testament. He's a good God to us. And we can see the fulfillment spanning both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I want to I look at a verse that shows that. Again, use the New Testament to interpret the Old Testament. Uh, so this one's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, as God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ, he anointed us, set a seal of ownership on us, put us his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So, this verse is talking about, ultimately, all of the promises find their fulfillment in Christ, which I think is a huge just beautiful picture of the revelation that God has given to us in Scripture being one unified picture. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, there are things that sometimes the the people that heard the message, you know, in that real time in the Old Testament thousands of years ago, it wasn't clear to them always what was being mm-hmm. prophesied. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we have the advantage of being able to look back and there's just and sometimes, sometimes we get on this topic around Christmas time as we see mm-hmm. the prophecies of Jesus' birth. But man, mm-hmm. it's just there are so many, and it, it is such it's such a faith building thing yeah. to see how God that God had Christ in mind before the foundation of the world, and here for thousands of years He was preparing for Christ mm-hmm. to come, and and Christ was already you know Christ was already in existence mm-hmm. and to see how that weaves in yeah. to the old testament history yeah. it, it is beautiful and it is encouraging yeah and i read one place where um maybe not every word is leading to christ mm-hmm. but every purpose for that word is leading to christ mm. and so that word you know in the old testament pick a random word was written and you can't see christ in just one little tiny word but the whole reason for that is to display Christ's work and the ultimate, like you said, the ultimate yeah. promise of Christ coming. Um, some of you may be familiar with the very first messianic prophecy. And messianic prophecy um, is a direct uh, promise of someone, and it, it, it remains a mystery, and we're going to talk about mystery in a second. It remains a mystery who this is going to be, exactly what it's going to look like uh, to come and fulfill and bring. It wasn't even God to earth yet. They didn't have that concept of God coming down as the Messiah himself, but someone would rise up to uh, fulfill these things that God had promised. And we see the very first one of this in Psalm, uh, Psalm Genesis 3.15. Uh, so God handed down the consequences to Adam and Eve and uh, for their sin in the garden. And this is part of the consequence that he's now giving Satan, who's the serpent. Um, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So there's going to be this, this disagreement, this strife between uh, Satan and, and, and mankind or woman, as he says, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. 
he will crush your head. We have no idea who the he is yet. Mm-hmm. And this he throughout the Old Testament, and I again, depending on how you count um, these prophecies, there's, there's hundreds of them, and they develop this further vision. Okay, he's going to come from this specific tribe in mm-hmm. Israel. He's going to come from this specific family, the family of David. Um, they even know somewhat the timing of him being born. Mm-hmm. And so that's why when you read the Christmas story, um, you, you see these wise men that are traveling mm-hmm. that kind of get this heads up. You see um, the king that wants to, to kill all the babies that are being born, and that's why they have to leave to go to Egypt because all the be- babies are being killed based on this prophecy of timing. Um, so this is the beauty of the promises and the fulfillment that we see leading up to Jesus. So that's my first way to view the Old Testament. You see the promises yeah. and the fulfillment. Uh, the, the second thing we've already talked about is this Old and New Covenant. Uh, you can view this as this covenant with God and his people in the Old Testament and with in the, in the New Testament. And the biggest difference in a covenant, I told you the covenant and contract are a little bit different. Uh, the biggest difference is... A covenant isn't dependent on both parties fulfilling their end of the deal. So going back to uh, the illustration of Joshua and this contract with a roofer, um, if the roofer didn't come through for you, you wouldn't pay the roofer. Right. That's how a contract works. Yes, yes. Covenant's a little bit different. Covenant's saying, I'm, I'm going to go so far into this that even if they don't fulfill it, not only do I fulfill my end of the deal, but I fulfill their end of the deal for them. And so this is why we see Jesus, because we couldn't fulfill our end of being righteous and faithful to God. Not only did he continue to be faithful to his people, he read Israel's history, he never fully left them, though often they were conquered, they were taken mm-hmm. over, there's still you know, a remaining group of, of faithful people. Not only did he fulfill his end by being faithful to them, He fulfilled their end by being the righteousness for us that we couldn't be for ourselves. It really, it gets into spaces that are kind of hard for us to understand because it it really points to the gospel, Mm -hmm. to something that we could never deserve, but God provided for us. And And instead of us having to earn something, going back to the contract where, you know, you get work for money or something like that, God just asks us, to follow Jesus, to come in faith, and then we benefit from mm-hmm. that covenant relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm not going to read all of this, but 2 Corinthians chapter 3 gets into this being a, a greater covenant. The, mm-hmm. the New Testament's a greater covenant. Um, the writer gets into the veil that was over Moses' face mm-hmm. and how that veil is a, a veil over the hearts of the people that read the Old Testament as the Old Covenant, and the Lord will unveil our hearts to who Christ is, um, being transformed, it says, and we all with unveiled faces, so we finally see Jesus now, contemplate the Lord's glory, be transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes to the Lord who's in the Spirit. Um, We could go back to the Old Covenant and read the promise of the New Covenant, and I read some of that in Hebrews, Mm -hmm. going back to the Jeremiah verse, Jeremiah 31. Uh, Hebrews 8 talks about a new covenant. Really, the whole book of Hebrews talks about um, kind of parsing out this new covenant work that God was at work in. So I think, again, seeing the promise and the fulfillment and then the old covenant and new covenant, you see the beauty of what's happening. And by default, you, you're you like, I don't want to throw away the Old Testament. Like, I would never right. do that. It, right. it brings... It brings more beauty to the New Testament if that's possible because you mm-hmm. see the weaving that God was doing through through the story of all of this. And so now I want to hit the third thing, and this can become uh, somewhat in the weeds and we can geek out about some of these things because it's, it's just fun to see what God was doing. Uh, and that's something called typology. Uh, typology, type, and antitype are these things that we see. Um, some it, It's a pattern, mm-hmm. uh, a pattern that um, God was doing something. He was using something in the Old Testament as a shadow to reveal the truth in the New Testament. And um, some people see this in everything of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Some people just see the major things. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to hit on a few things. 
just to see again how neat some of these things are. Um, and some are specifically real, revealed in the New Testament. Some of them aren't, but it's still like, surely God was doing this because we see this in the New Testament. And it's, it's just, again, kind of that geeking out stuff that, that people can do as they, they read. Um, so I want to look at Adam and Christ. So Adam was just a shadow of Christ. And you can almost say some ways a representative, but not really a representative because... Adam was fully Adam and who he was. So it wasn't just Adam was who he was because he was the forerunner for Christ. So they're, they're distinct. Right. Um, but still connected. Yeah. So like Adam was the first human man, and, and, but yet Christ, Christ was, you know, the, the first and only God who was man and so it, you're, it gets it gets really it gets really tricky, but it also gets really beautiful at the same time. Yeah, and I, it, it's that um, you don't want to miss the trees. Uh, there's even you don't want to miss the view of the beauty mm-hmm. in the midst of the trees and the right. details. Right. So you need to step out and then zoom mm-hmm. in. Step out, zoom yep. in. Um, so Romans five fourteen. And I'll back up to thirteen here a little bit to get more. Uh, actually, let's just go back to twelve. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in one way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. So before the Ten Commandments, the law, there's sin. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam. So Adam was still dying, even though he didn't fully have the law because Mm -hmm. he sinned. Uh, So death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses when the law did come. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, who is a pattern of the one to come. So he's the pattern of who? The one to come. That's a reference to Jesus. So this is the the type. He's a pattern. He's used to understand how we should see Christ, that Christ would now be the solution to those that knew the law and those that didn't know the law. Just mm-hmm. as Adam didn't know the law but yet sinned, those that do know the law sin, regardless, Christ came for that. Um, another one is the tabernacle. So, Joshua, give us a little background on the tabernacle from the Old Testament. So, after the Israelites came out of Egypt and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, God gave them very specific instructions to build this this house of worship, but it was like a tent because it was portable because they were moving, they were camping and moving and God would move them around to different places. So it was, it was a beautiful portable house of worship and God gave just verses and verses of detailed instructions Mm -hmm. as to the color, the size, the way that it would all be built, constructed, how to take it down, how to transport it. So just he actually, God's presence resided in this Tent and that is the most up. important part yeah, of it, absolutely, yeah. that God's presence was there. Mm-hmm. God's presence wasn't anywhere else in the world, but there in the tabernacle. So now we get to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. And I told you Hebrews talks about a lot of these things. They, the Old Testament priests and sacrificial system that they served under, they served at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as a covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant covenant is established on better promises. So tabernacle is a type of heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, tabernacle was very important for what it served. God's presence was there, but it was a pattern of what we get to see in heaven. And again, this is the beauty of it. And you go back, go to the, the book of Revelation and you read some of the description of, of heaven and you're like, well, this is weird. Like John measures out heaven, how big it's going to be. And he sees these different jewels. There's a, a jewel that makes up an entire gate going into heaven. And you go like, is this... Is this a physical description of what heaven is going to really look like? 
but it's all going back to what the tabernacle, I, I don't know exactly, again, this is where you geek out. Um, you know, I, I don't, the, the measurements aren't the same. They're better right. mm-hmm. just as it ends here there. It's a better, I think it's like miles and miles long. Tabernacle is just this, this small tent like mm-hmm. structure. Um, so it's all getting at how much better heaven is than any presence they had of God in the old Testament. Yeah. And, and here in Hebrews, it's, it's teaching us that the, the, the new covenant, the covenant under Christ was better than the old one. And I think that's the tension that we've been talking through the whole time is, we we appreciate the old covenant, but it's not where God wants us. God doesn't want us just to live in that space with all of the laws and the the things that He had before. Mm-hmm. But He was the same God, and there's things that we learn about God mm-hmm. through that. But looking through the New Testament lens is really the best way to understand that. Yeah, well, we're going to do one more First uh, Peter chapter three. Mm-hmm. There's another type, and this one is actually Noah and baptism. Uh, so we'll start First Peter 3, we'll start in verse 20. Uh, it said, To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers of submission to him. So this typology of baptism, it's not that Noah was saved on the ark simply because one day there's going to be a concept of baptism, Mm -hmm. but God used that in his wisdom. And maybe, you know, some people might say, well, why didn't God wipe them out with a huge fire that covered the earth? Mm -hmm. Well, because that would never symbolize what would save people in the New Testament one day. Mm -hmm which we see is this image of water, which he brings up. He says, baptism now saves you. Not, it's not the removal of dirt. That's not why you're getting baptized, um, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. And so that's a neat type, and it brings depth to baptism, and that's why we mm-hmm. emphasize it so much here at Norwin, one of the reasons. Um, and so even, you know, heaven, we get this depth of understanding this from the Old Testament as we read. So, again— to review these three things now, how we, why we view the Old Testament as important because we see the promises and fulfillments that are made throughout messianic prophecies and even other promises of God being faithful to his people. We see the appreciation of Old and New Covenant and kind of this progression of God's revelation of what he was going to do for us through Christ. And then we see these types and antitypes. And antitype is, is the fulfillment of that. And ultimately, uh, we see through that, that in Jesus in many different ways. Um, So to sum this up, I I don't see the Old Testament as something that, uh, to the letter of the law, we need to obey. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a lot of things that um, we sometimes bring up, um, um, you know, tattoos or something that a lot of people brought up for a lot of times, because it's mentioned the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament. I don't see that as uh, something that follows us into the New Testament, and uh, even the reason that some of these laws were given. But... We need to have great respect respect and honor knowing that God used that to show us uh, the better things. And, and we live in a time when we can know and be living under the new covenant. And so um, we have greater appreciation because we see the promises and the fulfillments. We see the old covenant and the new covenant and how they come together and are unified by Christ. And then we see the types uh, that are used in the Old Testament. So, and I think I think in the New Testament, even though, they're, even though God ask similar things for our lifestyle and some of the moral things mm-hmm. that we talked about. Mm-hmm. The way that, that Christ and the New Testament writers presented it is this heart transformation that then grows this fruit in our life that honors God, where it's a little bit different in the Old Testament, where the law is laid out a little more front and center, like here's the law versus here's this heart transformation behind it. And so God did want their hearts in the Old Testament, but it's different in the New Testament mm-hmm. in the way that God presents it. And I think that's I think that's key. Yeah, to where I'm, we're I, at. I'm glad you brought that up. Seventy four times in the New Testament, it is is it, it's written where someone says it is written. Wow. So there's seventy four times where they're referring back to the Old Testament, and oftentimes the Sermon on the Mount is a great example mm-hmm. of this, starting there in Matthew five, uh, where Jesus is bringing clarity to what became a normal practice because of how they interpreted the law. And he's saying, it's written to do this, but I say, mm-hmm. 
not that he's dismissing, he's actually bringing greater clarity. He's saying, hey, I, I say it's a heart issue. You mm-hmm. thought it was just all outside, but it's yes. actually inside. And so I'm glad you said that about transformation. And um, we understand God's heart for mercy and grace mm-hmm. in that, knowing, look, mm-hmm. we we are on a journey and trying to do our best to honor God. And often uh, we are hurt by the world around us. We, we sin and fall ourselves and stumble, but... If we're getting up and being faithful to God, then there's there's mercy and grace in that, and and we um, try to continue following and what what, what we see uh, in the New Testament and old. So we really appreciate you listening to this. Uh, maybe a bit of an extended episode than what we've had in the past few episodes, but I just thought it was something interesting, something that was placed on my heart. And as we look at the Old Testament and New Testament, and as Christians, we want to be informed uh, because when we're informed, we can share our faith uh, from a better position and maybe have those answers to defend our faith when asked. So, Joshua, thank you very much for introducing us and being part of this podcast today. I just want to thank you all for listening today. Thank you for tuning into NCC Unplugged. If you've enjoyed our podcast, please be sure to rate and review it and share it with your friends and family. If you are interested in learning more about Norwin Christian Church, visit our website at norwinchristianchurch.com. We also invite you to join us at NCC for one of our three services, Sundays at 8.45 and 10.30 a.m. and Thursdays at 7 p.m. We have engaging classes for all ages, ensuring there is something meaningful for everyone in our church community. Thanks once again for listening, and we hope you have a great week.